Let's get started. Thanks for joining us here in uh, lovely Antwerp for the Activity and Valdin uh, presentation, a match made in heaven. Uh, I'm Frederik Heremans, I'm from uh, Alfresco, I'm a software engineer. And I'm Petra Holmström, and I work as software architect at Valdin, which is, by the way, how we pronounce it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well said. So, what's this all about, actually? Um, you may remember uh, you registering for a DevOx, uh, DevOx conference. If you didn't, you climbed over a fence and got in for free. But most of you people saw the, the DevOx registration application. So actually, it's it's, uh, it's it's two parts. So the part you you guys saw, uh, where you clients, the people could register themselves for the conference. There's also a second part, which allows the DevOps staff to uh, keep an eye on the registrations, uh, look how many people registered and stick, things like that. So uh, we used the uh, Valdin UI for the front-end technology and uh, an activity back-end. So since it's a Java conference, it made sense to use uh, some cool Java technologies for this. So uh, when Stefan asked us, we didn't hesitate and just uh, went along with it. We used some additional technologies, for example, Hibernate for object persistence, since there was already a small, small part of the, the object model available for us, so we just leveraged that and took it in. We did some validation as well, uh, using the GSR 303 for uh, validating all the input you guys give us to get it in our model safely. And we used Spring to glue it all together. So why are we here? I'm asking myself the same question sometimes, but uh, so the architecture we, we came up with turned out to be uh, an effective uh, way to work. So uh, it was easy to fix. Sometimes some bugs came up and we, we could easily identify which part of the application we should address or which part of, uh, yeah, so which one was responsible for doing it. Also, uh, the features requested, some additional features were easy to implement as well. So. We're not going to show you the dark secrets of uh, DevOps registration today. We're, we just want to show you some uh, patterns and best practices for working with activity and volume. So we're going to show you uh, another application we made uh, using similar techniques we did for uh, DevOps registration. But first, uh, what is activity? So anyone in the room knows activity? Raise their hands. And anyone actually used it uh, somewhere? All right. Lucky few. Um, so, it's quite uh, quite a lot of people don't know it, so uh, it's going to be quite uh, entertaining. So, what is Activity? It's uh, an open source uh, BPM engine. Uh, it's Apache licensed, so you can do whatever you want with it. It's written in Java, uh, pure Java. So, uh, we try to make it very lightweight, um, allow it to be embeddable in, in your own application. The best example of this is actually Alfresco repository, which uh, uses activity under, under the hoods to drive the workflows on the document. So it's a good example of the embeddability. Um, it's also customizable, so you, we, we provided a lot of hook points for you to, to get in your custom coding or to yeah, really control what, what the engine is doing. So uh, last but not least, uh, it has first-class testing support. So we're all Java developers. We, we test our services. We test everything until nothing is remained to test. So it's very important to us that you can, can uh, test your business process as well. So it, it doesn't make sense if you just test your service layer and then just hope your process works. So we tried to do our best to have some first-class testing support for our JM3 and 4 and Spring so you can really test, test your process thoroughly. So it's not like only an Alfresco uh, effort. It's actually uh, quite a big community contributing to it. Uh, the core team is all uh, Alfresco employees, but there's uh, some external contributors from all over the world. We have an active community, and our motto from the beginning was release fast, release often. So um, in the beginning, we, we released every month. So I think a year and a couple of months ago, we start releasing every month, giving uh, bug fixes and features to the people, rolling out very quickly. So now we stepped a bit back, and every two, three months we're releasing. So that's a bit how the community works. When taking a step back, 
what we do is actually business processes. So if you look up what a business process is on Wikipedia, it's, it's a vague description of, yeah, it's, it's a collection of related activities and tasks for a particular goal, makes sense, and it's visualized with a flowchart. So in, in the past, there were different ways of, of defining how a process looks. So most of the time, we just put it in, in a big model. So um, a while back, some smart people sat around the table uh, and think about what's a good way to actually model or define how a business process should look like or should behave. So that's where uh, BPMN 2.0 stepped in the picture. So it's an uh, OMG standard finalized in March uh, this year. Um, it's, it's actually a pure play BPM standard, so really endorsed by big vendors like Oracle and, and uh, IBM. SAP, some of the big guys, so not just some invented standards at some university, but really uh, from, from, from the industry. It standardizes the safes in, in what we, you can use to, to draw your process. It also adds standard execution semantics, so you, you don't only specify how your process looks, but also how the execution will behave. Last but not least, the file format is standard, so this means you can just switch uh, the editors and just throw around your models from one to another, so it's, it's a standard format. And that's what we use in uh, an activity. So how does it work? Um, you take the engine, you throw in your processes and your own Java code, so you can, uh, it's easy to integrate with your own services. Activity does all the heavy lifting, like timers, jobs, uh, process handling, and it gives you a clean API which you can, can access. You can get uh, the workflows, you can start some processes, you can get tasks. It allows you to manage your engine, so it's, it's real, a clean API which, which gives you full control of, of your engine you're running. We also have an, uh, support for forms, so when your process needs to interact with, with people, um, we offer some standard uh, form support. In the example we're giving today, we, we don't use the form support, we leverage the, the richness of the, the file in UI. So you're free to use the forms, you can just use anything you want. However, it's more than just a library. So um, it's, it's, it's a good library, you can just use it as a jar in your project, but we, we offer some tools to make your life easier. For example, our activity designer. This is an uh, Eclipse plugin, which is um, freely available and allows you to model the process from within your development environment. So it not only allows you to draw uh, valid BPMN diagrams, it also allows you to really hook in the, the logic beneath it. So uh, that's quite powerful. So it's really activity tailored, so the process you draw here, you can actually just start executing without any intervention in XML or something. We also have a, a web-based modeler, which is uh, for the business people who, who don't want to install an Eclipse or something, or afraid of uh, installing stuff. So it, it runs in your browser, the only downside is it's, it's not really, uh, has not really much of activity tailored stuff in it. So it's, it's very good BPMN editor, but if you really want to execute it on activity, you should, there's an extra step needed. You need the uh, implementation details by hand. So we, when you download activity, we ship uh, our UI. It's, it's, it's written in Valden. This is actually a UI that covers our full API. So with this, you can start processes, view the tasks, um, inspect your database as well, inspect uh, what jobs are running, or they might have been stuck. So it's, it's actually the UI to communicate to the activity engine, if you want it. You can write your own, of course. To conclude, some technical highlights, which I think are quite useful. Um, so we support a lot of the BPMN 2.0 constructs. So this um, allows you to, to do timers, events, uh, gateways, multi-instance tasks. So it, it's, it's really all the heavy lifting. You should otherwise do with threading and, and all crazy constructs in Java. You can just use our engine and don't care about that. Just use it. We also have some uh, activity extensions, which uh, make the XML you create a, a bit shorter. So it's, if, if you really want to develop in XML, write a, write a process in XML, we allow some shorthands to, to make less repose.
it's, it's uh, also first class Spring support, so uh, if, you could, if you want a wider application with Spring, it's, it's just tailored for that, so uh, it's really nice as well. We have some built-in handling for uh, GPA entities, so you could basically stuff anything in the process as a variable, but if you use GPA entities, instead of just serializing the whole uh, entity, you just keep a reference and later on just fetch it from your entity manager. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a standard integration. If you want to have other models, you can, of course, just uh, add it to have a pluggable type mechanism. So in the latest, latest version of the version before that, CDI support was added. So this allows you to use your engine in a CDI environment and call beans from there. Now I pass it over to Peter. All right, so covering all the ins and outs of volume would probably take more than an hour, so I try to select the most essential parts and do it all in about four minutes or so. So what's volume? Well, first of all, volume is actually a Finnish word for a female reindeer. And this is something you can see in our logo as well if you turn it 90 degrees sideways. The curly bracket that form the horns also represent uh, Java, and the greater than sign that forms the nose represents HTML. So that's the story behind our logo. Wired is also a user interface framework for desktop like uh, web applications. So now some of you might think that this means you need to learn yet another set of configs, tablets, or syntax, or mess around with JavaScript and DOM and Apple and some plugins and stuff like that. Well, fortunately, no. This is pure Java and nothing else. You don't even need to know an HTML or CSS to create good-looking web user interfaces with Wired. You could think of Wired like a set of Legos. You start with very small building blocks and then you build up larger systems from this. And in the case of Wadin, the building blocks are the components, some of which you can see on the screen over here. We have quite a lot of components already out of the box available for you. Uh, if that's not sufficient, we have a directory service from which you can download and install additional components. And if that's not sufficient for you, you can write your own. Now, how does Wadin fit in into the Java ecosystem? Over here we can see some of the standard user interface libraries of Java. As you can see on the enterprise side we have JSP, JSF, and JavaFX, and on the standard side we have Swing. Now, although Wadin is not an official Java standard, you could think of it as the enterprise counterpart to Swing. The architecture in one slide. Basically, in a Wadin application, your entire application is living on the server side, and only the document object model resides in the browser. And the browser part is completely handled by the framework, so you can forget about the client side altogether. This makes it really simple to implement your user interfaces. Um, first of all, as I said, you can forget about the client side. Then the framework will make sure that the state of the user interface on the client remains in sync with the state on the server and vice versa. And also, as your user interface is actually running on the server, you have access to all the server resources. So if you like to add some more memory, then you add some more memory. And if you want to use some custom hardware, then you use custom hardware. We also think this approach is pretty flexible because you can use almost any Java tool or library in your user interface. And you can even use your favorite Java language, such as Scala, Clojure, or Groovy. We also think this approach is more secure than the conventional JavaScript-based user interfaces, and this is because of two things. First of all, all your code stays in the server, so it's impossible for a hacker to download your JavaScript code and analyze it in order to look for vulnerabilities. And also, there are a lot of less web services to protect. In a wide application, you basically have one single entry point, and that's an application server. So, what can you do with Widen, and what do other people do with it? Uh, I've collected some screenshots here of different Widen applications. As you can see, they are all actually very different from different fields. But they have one thing in common, and that is that they are all web applications, not websites. 
So they've all been made for a particular purpose in order to solve a particular problem, and they just happen to use the web server and web, server, web browser as their user interface. <coughs> so this is basically what Wyden is all about in a couple of minutes. Now let's move on with a little storytelling. Yeah, go ahead. Let's tell you a story. So instead of doing the registration process, we just decided to do something more original. So uh, we're gonna do a travel, uh, travel process. So it's quite simple. We have a company. Um, it sends people off to conferences abroad. So uh, the first thing they should do is request uh, if they can go. So that's what the process starts with. Then the manager needs to accept or approve it. If he says, no, you, you can't go, the, the request, the, the, the employee just get, get a mail containing, yeah, sorry, you can go. So that's easy. So if, if he can go, uh, some stuff should happen. So in, in our process, the secretary gets a task and she should book the tickets for, for the guy. When, when that's booked, a task is available for, for, for the employee. So when he returns from his travel and uh, he comes home and he has all these small, uh, small receipts, he can start filling his expenses to get everything back so uh, everything's happy at the end of the month. So once he fills in his expenses, he completes the task uh, and they get paid by someone at payroll in the last part of the process. All right, and now I'm going to show you this application in, in the monitor in here.
a bit better at that than presenting. At least that's what I say to my boss. So, all right. So here I have an eclipse with uh, the project uh, just uh, pulled from Git. Uh, we have, of course, as good developers, created a, 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 a test for our process. For our, uh, so just run it again to make sure it still works. So this is what I was talking about, about uh, the testing support we provide. Let's have a quick look. So it's, it's just a simple uh, a simple test, JUnit 4, running with Spring configuration, just wiring some services we need. And we have a special um, annotation, which ship with activity, which allows you to deploy a process, which in our case is our travel process within the context of the test you're running. So this allows you to have one test method, uh, have it running in a certain context so that you, you know when, the, when, when you start your method, you, you're sure that that process is deployed in your engine and you're starting from a clean, clean database. So this is one, one thing that makes the testing a bit easier. But we also see the activity rule. It's a JUnit 4 rule, which makes sure that the deployment annotation is scanned and uh, activity stuff is available. All right, so the first thing we do is, is we alter our process, of course. So we have um, it right here. So this is the editor I was talking about earlier. So um, it's just an, an, a plugin you, you download and you can start playing around. So we were just going to add an extra step before paying out the expenses. So we move this one. Come on. We can keep this part, we're still paying, paying out. We add an extra task, as we said. Full expenses. Then a decision right after it. One going down and one going back up. Make it look a bit nicer. There. So then we go fill in some details to make it uh, actually work, not just look pretty. Okay. It's back to enter expenses. So it's a, a second arrow. Sorry? So after the decision, you go back to enter expenses and not to approve expenses. Yes. yes. T-shirt. <laughs> All right. That was just a test to see the audience was still uh, awake. Good job. So now, as I said, we're gonna fill in some details. Let's call it a nicer name. Approve ex expenses. We're gonna make it only available for a manager. So we say the performer type is again group. It should be part of the group management. The next thing we, we should do is actually, this is a gateway, so it will only choose one of the two paths. So in order to have it decide, we're going to tell to this path, you only take this path if, if the manager actually approved. So later in the service, we'll just uh, make sure there's a, a variable available in our process, which is the invoice itself, so it's our, uh, our uh, GPA, uh, GPA bean. Um, so we can just write uh, an expression. To check if it's actually approved. So if it's not, it will take the, uh, the other flow, which has no condition on it. Right, so our process is, is, is ready. The next thing we do is take our uh, travel invoice service. It's actually the service that's going to be called from the UI by better. So we'll have to add two methods. Uh, it's approved. Invoice and just give a motivation why it's not approved. So the same for uh, for rejecting. So now just implement those two methods. Here they are. <coughs> so since we're we're using. 
using uh, existing domain models and process, we should make sure that everything runs in one transaction. So we yes, add the spring transaction annotation. Another annotation we created is um, something custom, which is require a group. So we actually say to, to the system that only uh, people in the group management, so it's using activity user management, so only people in the group management can actually invoke this method. So if somewhere from within the system, something goes wrong and this method is invoked by another user, it, it's an exception is strong. So this is a bit of security building using annotations on the services. So we're going to do that for the reject as well, because it's, it's the same. Actually, the, those two methods are basically identical. So we're just going to make a shared method, which is uh, set decision and save. Passing in the invoice, motivation, and then the decision. We are denied. So now we'll start implementing. So as I said, we, we're going to do three things. First, update the model. Second thing is set the variable. So later on in our flow, it's used to, to make a decision, to, make, to, to choose a path. And the third thing is actually completing the task. So updating the model is the easiest part. Just set the decision based on the decision we pass in and the motivation. We use the current user since um, we're sure that he's in a manager group, we can just use him as a, as a manager. So, And we do it today or now, all right? Of course, we <coughs> validate. We have some utility for that, which just throws an error when uh, the invoice fails validation. And uh, the easy thing is, Peter will handle that in the UI, I'll just throw the validation exception. So if, if no exception is thrown, we'll just save it. This is a simple save. All right, this is the first part. The second part is setting, setting the variable. So if you want to set a variable, you should get all of the process instance that's actually driving our, our request or travel request. So we prepared a, a method for this, which is actually quite simple. It just calls one of the activity APIs. It creates a process instance query, and it requests uh, the process instance with a, a certain business key. So you can start off a process and associate your own uh, business key with it. So you can find it back quite easy uh, afterwards. So in our case, it's just the ID of the travel request that was uh, created initially when the process started. So once we have the process instance, we can just say set variable, get the ID, we call it invoice, and the value is invoice, of course. All right. The last thing is completing the task. So again, we use uh, the activity APIs to get get a hold of the task that's currently active in, 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 the, in the process. So we create a task query. It's all through in the APIs our query, so you can just keep on typing. So I say give me all tasks within this process. And just to, to be sure, uh, we filter on the task name. So definition key, sorry. So we, I think it was approve expenses. And we get, we request a single result. So, last thing to do is just actually complete it. Right. So, this is actually a service, it's ready to use for better when he's going to build the UI. The one thing we, I, I want to show is, is that uh, our unit test, of course, is going to fail since we added some extra steps in the process, it should fail, otherwise it's not a good unit test, of course. So I'm hoping it will fail for once. No, it won't. <laughs> That's, ah, I didn't save it, sorry. should save, very important. Yeah, 
it takes quite a long time to run the unit test because we're running actually, ah oh crap, we're running actually <laughs> in, in, the, in the full context. So instead of mocking out services, we actually use the GPA services in our tests. This is a personal choice, of course. You can always just mock out everything else and just test your bare process. It's, it's, it's actually a choice you can make yourself. So we're just going to pretend uh, the test will fail. I think something is wrong with uh, the location of my process, however, simple travel. I think the condition in your sequence flow is wrong. Is it? I think you tried to type two times the decision. Yeah, but it is. It's, uh, it is? Yeah. It's decision. Decision. So it's decision, not decision. That's that's actually right. All right, but I'm gonna just just gonna show you some uh, the thing I was uh, normally if if it would fail. So this test is is actually the approved part. So you can see all the different steps, and and our our uh, framework allows you to really just have fine grain control of what's happening in your system. So for example. Uh, we just submit a new travel request, so we will check if it's, it's, it's actually created. So you could, you, you could do more things, you can check if it's uh, a certain type of, or if or certain task, tasks are active. So you can actually um, re-inspect the state of the process, so you can, you can, uh, can make sure nothing can go wrong. Alright, so I think it's time to pass it on to Peter. So we Switch the monitor again. Now my screen should show up. Yes, it does. And now I'm going to use NetBeans for the change. So now we need to add a new form to our application so that we can, the manager can actually see the expenses and also plug in the motivation and select whether he approves or rejects it. And in this application, we're utilizing the model view presenter pattern so that we can separate out the user interface logic from the code that actually builds the user interface. Unfortunately, we don't have time to cover the MVP pattern, so I'm just going to do some coding. And I'm going to start by creating a new view interface, which we'll call group expenses view. And we have, over here, we have a foundation project that contains a couple of abstract base classes that we can use in base interfaces. So I'm just going to extend this task form view interface like this. And now our view needs basically one thing, is the traveling invoice. Otherwise, we won't know what to show to the manager. So I'm just going to add a set invoice method and pass in the travel invoice. This is basically our view interface. Next, we're going to create a presenter that will drive our interface. Let's call it accrue expenses presenter. And we can extend the base class here as well, task form presenter. And I'll pass in our accrue expenses view as a generic variable, very parameter like this. Now, as we're using Spring and Aspect J, in this case, we have to add this configurable annotation because we're going to auto inject references to our backend services into this presenter later on. So, in the presenter, we need to define the actions that the user can do, and in this case, it's either approving the invoice, this, or rejecting. This is our presenter stop, and we're going to leave it like this for now, and return to it in a few moments. So now let's concentrate on the actual implementation of our view, view expenses view component. There, and again, I have some base classes view component. Pass in the view, presenter, and naturally, <coughs> I need to implement the view interface as well. 
And then we should have a lot of abstract methods, or only two abstract methods to implement. Again, we need to add configurable. And we're also going to add a new annotation that we've written ourselves. We're using a class path scanner library to detect classes with this task form annotation, and then we pass in a form key which is used to associate the correct form component with the correct task in the process definition. And this form key is approved expenses. All right, so let's start doing some voiding code then, because this is basically a voiding component that we're creating, a composite component. So let's start with the layout. some space around the layout, so we're going to turn on the margin, this, and we need some spacing around our components, sub-components as well, so we turn on the spacing, and we also want it to be full size, and as the layout itself is inside of this task form your component, we need to set the size of this component to full as well. And if you don't know why I'm doing this, come to our booth and we'll explain. So I'm going to return the layout. Then we need a title, like this, and we want this title to look like some kind of title, so we're going to assign a file name to it. Reindeer is our default user interface theme, like this, and I'll just add the title. And now we're going to see what this looks like. Right now, I'm using an embedded JTX server to run this, um, so I have to restart the server. If I were using JRobo right now, I wouldn't be waiting right now. But as I'm not, we're playing the waiting game. There. And I log in again as the manager. Here's an unassigned task, approve expenses, and here's our new form. It only contains a title. Now we need to add some more stuff. And first of all, we need to know which travel request is these expenses related to. So fortunately, I have over here a travel request viewer component, which I already created and used in some other views. So I can reuse it over here. Travel request viewer component. Request viewer, that's fine. And then we need to show the expenses as well, and as a matter of fact, they have a component for that as well over here. Enter, and uh, see, it's the expenses viewer component. So I'll add that one as well. Expenses viewer. Expenses viewer. I always tend to mix up the S and C is in the word expenses. Um, then we need a text area for the motivation. And a view button. Approve button. Sounds nice. Reject button. Not so nice. And a cancel button if it covers. Um, let's create this components. Request viewer. New arrow. Request viewer component. And add it to the layout. that. Do the same with the expense viewer. That. Now we're going to do some user interface stuff, so we're going to specify that the expenses viewer should fill up all the main space. And I'm going to set the expense ratio Two, because I want this expenses euro component to be twice as tall as the motivation text field, which is something I'm creating right now. Let's use the motivation as a caption. Set it to say square size four. We add it to our layout. This. And set the expand ratio. So as you can see, I'm um, only using Java. I haven't touched a single CSS or HTML file. Then we're going to add some buttons. 
And then when this button is to be aligned in a horizontal row, so I'm going to create a separate horizontal layout for this. There. And I want some spacing between the buttons to make it look good. So I'm going to turn on the spacing and add the buttons to my layout. Now our 
represent the result of change. So now let's have a look at what happens. And we play the waiting game a third time. Lots of excitement, exciting log entries here. There we go. And let's reload. And now we can see the information. Here's the travel request, and we have the diamonds in the taxi. And the boss is not going to allow the company to buy diamonds for 10,000, so we reject this. So now let's log in as the traveler. Now the enter expenses task is back. And there's one thing missing from this view. We can't see the motivation anywhere. And as we have about 12 minutes left, plenty of time to implement this as well. So we're going to go to this. Let's see, it's the enter expenses from view component. And I'm going to add a new label. motivation and we'll add it over here so that if this request uh, this invoice has been rejected we will get the motivation over here between the description and the expenses table so let's see this the expenses editor will add it over here rejection new label it doesn't contain anything right now let's see the caption Rejected. We want it to show be very visible this label, so we're gonna change the style name. Let's use the header two style for example. And we want it to be hidden unless the invoice is actually <coughs>
can build your own applications on top of it. You can rip it apart and make a note of this URL if you're interested. Because this slide is going away in five, four, three, two, one. So if you want to continue on with activity, because we just touched the surface of activity today, just saw some user interaction, but there's a lot more to it. So just visit our website, activity.org, or grab someone of the activity team. Uh, they're all here right now, I think. Um, another good place to start is the Activity in Action, uh, the book by Thijs Rademaak. It's going to be available uh, as an uh, e-book in the uh, beginning next year, so it's not, not a long time anymore. So Manning Early Access is already available. You should definitely check it out if you, if you want to learn more about activity. Yes, and if you thought, well, it was really great and you want to get started with it, then one thing you could do is visit our website, www.wadi.com. You should also read the book of Wadin. It's available online. And as a matter of fact, I happen to have a complete box of books right here. So the 20 or so of you who are the cookers can get a copy from for free after this presentation. And you should also definitely come to our booth and talk with us and get a free ref card. Now we have about seven minutes left of our time slot, so if you have any questions, we're happy to try to answer them.